Good morning, church. Welcome to our virtual traditional service where we want to worship and cling to Jesus, our Savior, who is our sure rock and foundation in these days. We're so glad we can still celebrate Palm Sunday together, a day that Jesus was celebrated as King on earth, a foretaste of what's to come. Today we focus together on his kingship and his sovereignty and his love and care for us in these days as his beloved children, which I know that I really need. So let's look at John 12 one together. The next day, the great crowd that had come to the festival heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem. So they took branches of palm trees and went out to meet him, shouting, Hosanna, blessed is the one who comes in the name of the Lord, the King of Israel. Jesus found a young donkey and sat on it, as it is written, Do not be afraid, daughter of Zion. Look, your king is coming, sitting on a donkey's colt. His disciples did not understand these things at first, but when Jesus was glorified, then they remembered that these things had been written of him and had been done to him. Let's sing and worship together.
I love those words we just sang. He sets the prisoner free. He's near us. His promise, I am with you evermore. And finally, the one I love the most, friend of sinners, plead for me. And I love that he's my friend and I'm a sinner, but he's also king of kings and lord of lords. So let's worship him as we continue on in light of the fact that he is our king and he has so much power over us and our world in these fragile days. Let's pray 
pray together. Oh God, as we just sang, we want to ever praise you with heart and life and voice and in your blissful presence forever rejoice. We find ourselves unbelievably thankful and blessed that a king would be our friend and that our creator would walk beside us. Help us to see how very powerful and yet how very close you are to each of us. We are restless until we find our rest in you, our conqueror and our king, Jesus Christ. In his powerful name we pray, amen. Well, indeed, good morning, and it is so good to gather together, maybe not with feet and faces, but with electrons and avatars. My name is Ed Stetzer. I have the privilege of leading the Billy Graham Center at Wheaton College and also the privilege of sharing God's word today with you. You know, normally we'd welcome everybody from all of our campuses, but we're all at home. So let's just welcome everybody everywhere who's watching along with us today. And may you be encouraged. May you be provoked to love and good deeds, as the writer of Hebrews says. Why? Because this is uh, the beginning of what's called Holy Week. Though it's a time of Holy Week where we'll be uh, apart, but still together. We'll be socially distant, but relationally connected by a common understanding that God has sent Jesus and Jesus came and lived a sinless life, died on the cross for our sin and in our place and God raised him from the dead on the third day. Of course, this is the beginning of Holy Week and so the Sunday at the beginning of Holy Week is what's called traditionally Palm Sunday. And so you've already heard that from our worship team. You've heard the word Hosanna at its most literal means save us, God save us. And so as Jesus came into Jerusalem riding on a donkey, the people would take palm fronds, palm branches, and more than that, but they would wave them or lay them down in front of the coming Messiah, the coming King, and the crowd celebrated Jesus, and they proclaimed him, and they called out, and they said, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. And in doing so, they were proclaiming what they believed Jesus to be. We know that it wasn't longer after that that other crowds, maybe not the same people, but other crowds would cry out, crucify him, crucify him. So what changed? How did we go from Hosanna, Hosanna, to crucify him, crucify him? And part of that certainly was a misunderstanding of the mission itself. You see, the people then, maybe in some ways like us now 2,000 years later, were in a difficult and dark time. The Romans had occupied their nation. They, we heard phrases like, go the extra mile, literally meant that if a Roman soldier said to you, put this pack on your back and walk a mile, you'd say, I'll go an extra mile. We know that there was crucifixion, was not just the crucifixion of Jesus, our Savior, but was a common means and a common method, ultimately, of torture and death. This was not a good time to be in Israel. And yet, in the midst of that, the people saw and cheered, Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. So the question, I think, for us is, how might we think about then and how might we think about now? You see, there was a confusion about the moment they were in. And they were confused because they didn't know if Jesus was coming to throw off the Roman Empire and its oppression, to set free the captives, to make everything right. We actually know that after Jesus was resurrected, the disciples would ask in Acts 1-6, Lord, at this time, are you restoring the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus said, no, 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 it's not for you to know the times or the periods the Father has set by his own authority, but you'll receive power, the Holy Spirit, to be witnesses. So what we see is Jesus coming into Jerusalem in the final week of his life, the crowds cheering out his name because they too needed saving. The moment they were in might have been a little confused, but the mission Jesus was on did not change. Matter of fact, we might conclude that they didn't understand the mission Jesus was on because they were ready for a political kingdom. They were ready for an economic overthrow. They were ready for all things to be made right. Here's the challenge for us and for me and you as a follower of Jesus, 2,000 years later, we're still ready for everything to be fixed right. We don't want to live in a world where there's a virus that's spreading through our community that's impacting people that we love. We don't want to live in a world that's still broken. 2,000 years ago, they said, Hosanna, God save us. 2,000 years later, we still cry, Hosanna, God 
save us. And it's a confusing moment that we're in. It's a confusing moment because we know that some of our friends are suffering. And people are suffering physically. We know that. We've seen that. People are suffering economically. We know that. We see that. We want to cry out, Hosanna, God save us. But here's the thing I don't want you to miss. 2,000 years ago, maybe many of those people misunderstood the mission of Jesus Well, the moment we're in is confusing, but the mission we're on remains unchanged. And maybe they didn't understand fully the mission that Jesus was on in the midst of that uncertainty then and uncertainty now. Palm Sunday anchors us again in our unchanging faith. Jesus on his mission continues and in the midst of what they experienced 2,000 years ago, sorrow, hardship, and suffering, Palm Sunday reminds us that the beginning of this week of Christ's passion, the passion of the Christ, he would suffer for sinful humanity, men and women like you and like me. And we see that kind of suffering and we see suffering now and How might we respond? Fundamentally, 2,000 years ago, I'm not sure that many of the people cheering Hosanna understood the mission he was on, that Jesus came to die on the cross for our sin and in our place. Fundamentally, we still cry Hosanna 2,000 years later because we want all things to be fixed and to be made right. So if 2,000 years ago on that Palm Sunday, they misunderstood Jesus' mission and maybe by the end of Holy Week, they were disappointed that he hadn't come and overthrown the Romans. He hadn't made everything right. So how might we understand Jesus' mission? Well, that's what I want us to do today. I want us to focus on that by looking at Matthew chapter 9. Matthew chapter 9, I want us to look at the mission of Jesus and understand it maybe in a way that the crowds did not so we can join Jesus on that mission. Let's take a look at Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 35, and I'll read from uh, verse 35 to 38. It'll also be on the screen so you can follow along. It says, Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Now, here we begin with a picture of ultimately what's going on. It says, when he saw the crowds, don't you miss this, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. I want you to know we find a lot out about Jesus here, right? We get some descriptions of his character, his emotions, and in doing so, we can understand even more fully his mission that maybe 2,000 years ago, on Palm Sunday, they didn't get. They maybe were disappointed by the end of the week because he didn't bring that earthly change, but instead he brought a spiritual and invisible kingdom that made citizens like you and me who became instruments of the kingdom of God 2,000 years later still showing and sharing the love of Jesus. That's our call because that's Jesus' mission. Now, let me tell you a little bit about the placement of Matthew chapter 9. If you've read through the Gospel of Matthew at all, you might know a couple things. Um, Matthew 5 through 7 is actually the Sermon on the Mount, the most important sermon preached by the most important person who ever preached a sermon, King Jesus. And in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus explains kingdom living. In chapter 10, it's actually a sermon commissioning the disciples to go on mission. And so chapters 8 and 9 are somewhat of a transitional passage, and in that transitional passage, There's more teaching, there's more information that's given, but the passage in Matthew 9 ends, the transitional passage ends with the verses we just read. And so I want us to actually draw a few things from that passage, right? We're going to work kind of through this passage, pointing us to understanding the mission of Jesus. So as we cry 2,000 years later, still, Hosanna, God save us, we might rightly understand Jesus' mission and join him on that mission. So first and foremost, let's talk about the ministry of Jesus, the ministry of Jesus. We'll get a picture of what's going on here by looking at Matthew chapter 9, verse 35. Let's dig a little deeper. Jesus went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. Now this passage, this language that Matthew uses here is actually something that Matthew uses uh, more than once in the Gospel of Matthew. It's kind of his way of resetting a section. It's his way of saying, okay, this is end of one section. We're moving into another section. It actually repeats uh, Matthew 4, 23, pretty much verbatim, just a couple of words different. And so Matthew's telling us, all right, this is the end of a section and there's an important truth to be gleaned out from 
uh, that section. There's a big shift, right, that's going on here as well. Now, I want you not to miss this because we need to begin to understand that the moment we're in may be confusing, but the mission Jesus was on and the mission we're on remains unchanged. The moment we're in does not change the mission we are on. Let me say it again. The moment we're in does not change the mission we are on because we're on Jesus' mission. So we're looking back 2,000 years to say what then was his mission. Well, it says Jesus came teaching, preaching, and healing which is pretty much what it says in chapter 4, verse 23. We get a picture. Jesus came teaching, preaching, and healing. A key theme, right? And everywhere Jesus went, there was rightful teaching, there was rightful preaching, and there was healing because his kingdom had broken into the world. The kingdom had come because the king had come. So we look at this picture and we know what it looks like when the kingdom of God fully comes. We know that the word of God is rightfully loved and affirmed, valued, and lived. We know that there's healing. And when Jesus healed, it was complete, instantaneous, and total. But we also know that the kingdom of God has not yet fully come. That's why we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And as we in Chicagoland now face what we're just a week or so behind, what New York looks like, which is now the center of the global pandemic, we will cry out again, Lord, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. You know why? Because it's not yet fully done. You say, but Ed, the kingdom has come. The kingdom has come, yes, but it's already here, but it's not yet fully here. So we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, a day when we don't know sickness and we don't know death. And so Jesus is, again, bringing that kingdom message. He went through all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, proclaiming the good news of the kingdom and healing every disease and sickness. So Matthew 9, 35 is a restatement of Jesus' ministry. He's saying again what he would do, right? So this is Matthew describing Jesus' actions. And it's also a prayer we'll see in just a moment to join Jesus in that ministry. Now, again, in John 12, we actually read, we don't go there for the sake of time. In John 12, we actually read of Jesus' triumphal entry into Jerusalem on that first Palm Sunday 2,000 years ago. Great crowds came to see him, to praise him with their palm fronds, which we lack today, and yet we might wave other things because he is indeed the Messiah, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the Lord. But the cries of Hosanna in John 12 would turn to jeers of crucify him in John 19. Why? Because they misunderstood the mission. And so we can remind ourselves that the moment we're in does not change the mission we're on, right? And for us, seeing that people tried to redirect or they tried it more than once to kill Jesus or to redirect his mission, in Luke 9, 51, it says Jesus resolutely set out for Jerusalem. He knew what he was there to do. He knew that the crowds that cheered him on would not ultimately be the final message that he would receive in Jerusalem. He would be spat upon, he'd be crucified, he'd be more. And through this week, we'll celebrate that? It's a strange word to use. There's a reason we call Good Friday Good Friday. How can it be Good Friday when it's such a bad thing happened? But ultimately for us, Jesus' death on the cross for our sin and in our place is a good thing that came from a dark thing. So we know as Jesus comes into Jerusalem, he knows what's coming. He has a certainty of what is before him, but he resolutely sets out for Jerusalem. Why? Because the moment we are in does not change the mission we are on. God's still active in the world. The Holy Spirit's still working today. Today, we are the hands and feet of Jesus. As Wheaton Bible Church and all of its expressions and campuses has not said that this virus puts us on pause, but instead we are still on mission. Why? Because the moment we're in does not change the mission we are on. Everyone sort of distanced can sometimes lead to a pause in what God has called us to do, but instead We say, yes, Lord, here we are. We're still on mission. We're not on pause. We're on mission. So we've suspended some of our normal activities like meeting together, right? So it's a strange thing to speak to an empty room, but I know thousands of you are actually watching right now. And we know that as we suspend some of those things, but we have to engage in other things. The church has literally left the building. For 20 years, people like me and others have written books or blogs or podcasts talking about how 
the church needs to be on that mission, that kingdom mission where it's preaching and teaching and healing like Jesus did. For 2,000 years, that was the focus. For the last 20 years, we've tried to change it. And in, in about three weeks, this virus did what about 20 years of books and blogs and podcasts didn't. The church has left the building. So again, the moment we're in does not change the mission we're on. So we're here to show and share the love of Jesus in our communities, where our campuses and where our families are. So we can see things like people posting encouragement online, and we should, or checking in on our elderly neighbors. I had the privilege of going, again, engaging my neighbors. I went and knocked on one door. I always ring the doorbell with my Lysol uh, sheet, and I uh, press that doorbell, and I step back. And, and you know what we find? I, I found my next-door neighbors, they don't have internet. They actually told us they don't do the electronics, older couple. You know, my job, part of my role now is to check on them and to see else, who others. I went by with a yellow notepad, wrote down people's names and phone numbers so I could pray. And then when the worst comes, we could check on one another. So things we can do right now in our own neighborhood, check on our elderly neighbors, your neighbors use um, video chat, phone calls, text to encourage one another for prayer, demonstrating peace in the midst of that chaos. And a lot of people are searching for hope. It's actually a news story, talked about this unusual spike in searches for the word prayer. We saw on the front page of the Drudge Report, a link to a, a Wall Street Journal article talking about, is this a time of great spiritual awakening? People are searching for hope. We say, Hosanna. Hosanna, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. God save us. And the world needs to hear that same message of God's salvation. So we begin first and foremost by looking at the ministry of Jesus. It's a kingdom ministry because the kingdom has come. Number two is perhaps equally fascinating. Number two is the compassion of Jesus. Now, Matthew is actually describing Jesus' emotions. We don't get this a lot, so worth paying close attention to how Matthew is actually describing what's going on. Here's what Matthew says. He's writing about Jesus. He says, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. I don't want you to miss that, right? They were, they were harassed and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. That's a description of these people without Christ. And can I tell you today, it's a right time for us to have compassion for people who are facing this pandemic and global crisis without Jesus. Now, I know that we want to have the compassion for every single person in every single situation, and we should. But can I tell you that as a follower of Jesus, I look to Romans chapter 14, 8, and I, and I can say, if I live, I live for the Lord. If I die, I die for the Lord. But there's a whole lot of people right now who are living in an elevated level of anxiety and fear who need to know a peace that passes all understanding. I hope that's what you're walking in, right? The writer Paul in Philippians says that we should have peace that surpasses all understanding. So right now, my hope for you is you're facing this crisis saying, you know what, I I have trust in the Lord. Uh, if I get sick, if I don't get sick, if I, I'm going to trust in the Lord. I'm not saying there's not some normal level of stress and concern, but I am saying you have a peace that passes all understanding if you're a follower of Jesus abiding in him. So my encouragement to you is this, is to have a deep sense of compassion because that's what Jesus is described as having here. He had compassion for them. Now, let me tell you a little bit about that word, compassion in the Greek. I'm going to go a little deeper because this is Wheaton Bible Church. This isn't like Wheaton Opinion Church. So let's go a little deeper into what that word means. Compassion does not translate well into any English word, right, than the Greek word. Literally, it means to be moved in our inward parts. Actually, literally, it means to be moved in one's bowels, but that means something else for us today. So we translate it as compassion. The bowels were thought to be the seat of love and pity. And it says Jesus had compassion at the very core of his being, right? I think about Philippians 1.8, which says this, God can testify how I long for you with the affection of Christ Jesus. That's the same word that says Jesus had compassion. There's a longing with a deep affection. That's how Jesus felt, Matthew tells us, about people who did not yet follow him, did not know him. It's a gut-wrenching, heart-melting, aching for people. And I don't want you to miss that. I don't want you to miss It's a love that hurts deeply, right? And that's what we feel today. We hear stories. Yesterday, I, 
I interviewed on a radio show a pastor from New York, the Bronx, one of the hardest hit areas. And you could feel the compassion that he had. Last week, I had the privilege of interviewing some pastors in Spain and Italy, one who began to weep in the midst of our interview. I don't want you to miss this because this is a time when we are concerned and caring and having compassion for others. I want you to have that. But I want you also to have the kind of compassion that Jesus had and Jesus evidenced here. Jesus, don't you miss this, Jesus has more compassion for people who are lost and hurting today than you or I could ever possibly have. It's a perfect compassion for those who are sick, for those who lose a loved one, for those who are confused and fearful today. So this Palm Sunday can be a reminder for you and for me that in the middle of a global pandemic, Jesus cares more for the world than I do or you do or all of us combined. And so Matthew describes his emotion and it's interesting when he describes his emotion, he uses words very difficult to translate, but we can now know when Jesus says he had compassion on them, 2,000 years later, Jesus still has compassion on people who don't know him, people who are hurting, people who are struggling. Now, why do I say these things? Because I want you not to miss that perhaps the disappointment of the crowd that cheered Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, is that he brought the kingdom, but not in a way that they expected. They expected a kingdom that was overt and overthrowing, that would overthrow the Romans, that would restore the world to rightful justice and righteousness. And that's coming. I don't want you to miss that. That's coming. Jesus will return. And when he does, the kingdoms of this world become the kingdoms of our God and King and everything is set right. There's no more sickness. There's no more injustice. There's no more brokenness. But that day has not yet come. So we pray, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. But I want you not to miss this, that the kingdom that Jesus brought was a kingdom that's not of this world, whose citizens, Jesus said in John 3, are born again and they receive new life. And so what then might we think of this holy week? Can I just encourage you that this is perhaps the most significant week of your life to share the good news of the gospel with your friends and your neighbors. Now, why would I say such a thing? Well, we did research a few years ago when I ran an organization called Lifeway Research, and we found that there are three times when people think, more than three, but the top three times that people would be open to spiritual matters is during the Christmas season, during the Easter season, and during a national or natural disaster. So we have two of the three top times that people will be open to the gospel. We on Palm Sunday are acknowledging the fact that maybe those people didn't understand his mission, but 2,000 years later, I hope that we do. Jesus came to seek and save the lost, Luke 19, 10 says. Now let's take a look and see if people actually are engaged in that. I mentioned that I used to run a research company. Let me show you some stats that we, we did from this research company. We actually asked among Protestant churchgoers, Uh, Do you agree or disagree somewhat or strongly with this? I have a personal responsibility to share my religious beliefs about Jesus Christ with non-Christians. 55% said they strongly agree. 24% said agree somewhat. In research, we tend to combine agree somewhat and strongly and say 79% of people agreed somewhat or strongly that they have a responsibility. I imagine if you're at Wheaton Bible Church, you think that already. What I'm saying to you is this may be the greatest moment in your lifetime to do what you already believe you should do. Now, it doesn't end there, though, because the reality is there's not a lot of gospel sharing going on. I mean, if we all believed that 79% agreed that we have a responsibility, you'd think there'd be all kinds of gospel sharing going on. You'd think Facebook would be filled with gospel sharing. Maybe they don't feel comfortable. Well, we actually asked that question. We asked this, again, among Protestant churchgoers, I feel comfortable that I can share my belief in Christ with someone else effectively. Actually, so people actually, the strong news go down some, but it's actually 74% are actually saying somewhat or strongly they feel comfortable. So it's not a, not, not a situation where people are uncomfortable or unaware. So there should be all kinds of gospel sharing going on. And if this week is the most opportune moment in your lifetime to share the good news of the gospel, then there should be, Facebook should be filled with these testimonies of the good news of God. So let's, let's actually look a little more. Let's actually ask, well, are people actually doing that? Here's another question that we asked. 
Um, among Protestant churchgoers, how many people have you shared how to become a Christian with? Here's, take a look at this slide. All right, so 61% say zero. In the last six months, I haven't shared with anybody how to become a Christian. And one was 16% and it goes down from there. So the vast majority shared with nobody how to become a Christian. And you may say, Ed, that sounds a little intimidating. Maybe could I just have invited them to church? Let's take a look. Actually, 48% say zero is the number. If we look more closely at the next slide, it says invited an unchurched person to attend a church service or some other program at your church. Actually, 48% still say zero and zero and one makes up 68%. So the vast majority of people have maybe invited nobody or maybe one friend to church. You say, well, Ed, we can't invite anybody to church now. Actually, you can. And if this week is the most opportune time in your lifetime to share the gospel, you actually will. See, it may be, maybe one of the impacts of this novel coronavirus, COVID-19, will be a renewal of compassion for people who are hurting and lost. Remember, this is an opportunity to show and share the love of Jesus. The moment we're in does not change the mission we're on. This could indeed be the most significant opportunity to share the gospel in your lifetime and mine. Let's look at number three on our outline, right? We've looked at first and foremost, we talked about the, um, the ministry of Jesus, how he came preaching and teaching and healing. Then we look at number two, the compassion of Jesus, how with this gut-wrenching compassion, Jesus cares far more for hurting and lost people than you and I ever could. And then we looked at number three on our outline, the sending of Jesus. Now let's look and let's go a little deeper with this here and get a picture of what's going on at this moment. Here's what it tells us. This is Matthew 9, 37 and following. It says, then he said to the disciples, and you've heard this verse for us. As soon as I read it, you're gonna be like, I recognize this if you've been to church before. It says, the harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. This is the first words recorded of Jesus. We had his actions, his emotions, and now we have his words in this short passage. The harvest is plentiful, but the workers are few. Asked the Lord of the harvest, therefore, to send out workers into his harvest field. See, the mission of Jesus was actually to save those who did not know him, to call a people who would show and share his love to a broken and hurting world. And 2,000 years later, that may never be truer in the next week or so than it is in our whole lives. Because this is indeed the biggest crisis of our lifetime. A month ago, maybe people weren't saying that. There was some debate about these things politically. That unhelpful debate has passed. And we have pretty much universally people saying that these next few weeks are going to be really bad. But here's the thing, perhaps the most important thing I can do in the most in these next few weeks is to join Jesus on his mission, showing and sharing his love. I'm gonna care for others, right? So we've got uh, plans in place. We've already started to be able to engage some of our community uh, because it's gonna get bad in the next couple of weeks, maybe serving healthcare workers, maybe finding folks who are experiencing food insecurity in our community and beyond. Uh, for me, I'm engaging in some ministries in downtown Chicago, helping to resource them in the midst of these realities, right? This is our moment, followers of Jesus. This is the time when we hear Jesus clearly calling us to join him on mission. And so the call is here. The question is how ultimately will God's people respond? So Jesus actually tells us to pray for the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest field. That's what I'm praying right now for you and for me. People pray a lot, it's interesting. A few years ago we did a research project and we asked people this question. We asked, how often do you pray? Or have you ever prayed for, excuse me, people who mistreat you, 41%, I don't know how they're praying for them. They might be praying for them to bad things to happen, I don't know. 37% say they pray for their enemies. 21% say winning the lottery. 20% uh, say success in something you put almost no effort into. 14% say God to avenge someone. 13% said for your favorite team to win. Um, did, I want you not to miss something though. I want you to look closely at that list for just a second. You'll see the one that says winning the lottery, 21%. I want you to remember that number 21. I want you to remember that number 21, not so that you can play that number, but I want you to remember that number for just a second, right? You may, we see that one down there. It says uh, not to get caught speeding, 7% of people pray for that. I, 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 for the record, I've prayed for that. But 
We asked more closely, what do people typically pray for, right? That's what have you ever prayed for? 21% say winning the lottery. Let's take a look at another graph. This is things that people typically pray for. They pray typically for family and friends. They pray for my own problems. They pray fourthly for my own sin. 38% people in natural disasters, but that's higher today. But I want you to look down to the 20%. It says people of other faiths or no faith. In other words, about 20% of people say they typically pray for people who are not Christians, perhaps with the assumption that they might pray for them to uh, become Christians. But here's the thing I don't want you to miss. Remember, I wanted you to follow closely the number 21%. That's the percent who pray, have ever prayed for winning the lottery. And now we see 20% typically pray for people who don't know Christ. I want you not to miss this, right? So Jesus tells us to pray for workers in the harvest, but more people say that they've prayed to win the lottery than normally pray to win the lost. Now, that ought to be an important reminder for us in what may be the most significant week in your life and mine to share the good news of the gospel. So back to our passage, right? We're between Matthew 5 through 7. That's kingdom living. That's the Sermon on the Mount. Following in Matthew 10 is when Jesus commissions the disciple. So the disciples, remember, Matthew is ending this section with this reset passage. Jesus is teaching and preaching and healing, and he's resetting it. And this is the pivot point when actually the disciples move from being those who receive God's message. They're the the objects of Jesus' ministry to now they're actually the people who are the sharers of that message. They are actually sent on mission in Matthew chapter 10. Now, don't miss this, right? Because I have, um, I have um, one daughter. I have three daughters, which is uh, uh, been <laughs> quarantine. Three daughters. <laughs> There's so many words. But anyway, another story for another day. Um, so my one daughter, whose name shall remain nameless, though I do pay them and pre-negotiate illustrations when I use them, lest you think I just use them as illustrations. But um, one of my daughters just is a, has a messy room all the time. And I stood in her room once and I said, you would think that teenagers would know how to clean their rooms. Now I want you to know I wasn't talking about generic teenagers, I was talking about her. So with that in mind, listen again to Jesus' words to his disciples. Here's what he says. Jesus says to his disciples, pray, ask the Lord of the harvest, therefore to send out workers into his harvest field. What you know is in the very next chapter, Jesus sends them out as workers in the harvest field. So today, let's pray for workers in the harvest field And let's recognize that immediately after saying that, Jesus sent his disciples into the harvest fields. Now, I don't want you to miss this because I think this is the moment that God has placed us in, a confusing moment, but the mission has not changed. The moment we're in does not change the mission we're on. There's a beautiful passage that I want to kind of end with. And in there, you'll see three things from it. It's don't be afraid, have peace, go on mission. That's what I'm actually asking you today, this week, and on forward to do. Don't be afraid. Have peace. Go on mission. You say, where do we get that? It's actually John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19. It's a beautiful passage. It's actually, to be perfectly honest, it's my favorite passage in the entire Bible. It's John chapter 20, beginning at verse 19, and it goes through and it says this. Right first, don't be afraid. How do we not be afraid? Look at John 20, Verse 19, it says this, on the evening of that first day of the week, when the disciples were gathered together with doors locked for fear of the Jewish leaders, 2,000 years later, a lot of people right now behind closed doors and afraid. And what I want to say to you is that Jesus is about to appear and he's going to tell them to have peace. So don't be afraid, right? Let her be, have peace, right? Here's what it says next. It says, Jesus came and stood among them and said, peace be with you. Now, don't miss that. Jesus says, peace be with you. They're afraid. He says, peace be with you. 2,000 years later, a lot of people are afraid, and we say together, peace be with you. After he said this, he showed them his sands and his side. The disciples were overjoyed when they saw the Lord. Again, Jesus said to them, peace be with you. Listen, if Jesus says something once, you ought to be paying attention. When he says something twice, it ought to define your life. And right now, sisters and brothers, a lot of people need peace. Don't be afraid. Have peace. Go on mission. See, Jesus says in John 20, 21, the key words of Jesus, as the Father has sent me, I am sending you. 2,000 years later, those words, the disciples heard it and they went. 2,000 years later, we go. 
And we do so by showing and sharing the love of Jesus. You say, Ed, how could we show, how could we demonstrate sharing the love of Jesus? Well, there's a lot of challenges to do that. I get that. But we can do that practicing social distancing. We can minister to the hurting. We can may not be physically touching people, but we can share food. We can engage our neighbors. We can watch out for the elderly and those with underlying conditions and more. We can show the love of Jesus. And I want you to know something too. We can share the love of Jesus. Um, I don't know if you've noticed, but a lot of people are spending a lot more time on Facebook lately. And um, I actually uh, just hacked on to Pastor Rob's Facebook page. It's actually a picture of Pastor Rob's Facebook right now. I, I actually am debating whether or not to post something there from me that is actually in his name. We could have a lot of fun with his Facebook page. But I want you to look at a button right there. You can see it on Facebook. It's on your Facebook, just like it's on Pastor Rob's Facebook. And it says live video. Now, you may be afraid to press that button, but I want to ask you to press that button this week. And here's what I want to ask you to do. I actually want to ask you to press that button on Good Friday, maybe Holy Saturday, and to speak your testimony. All you need is a little camera on your computer. It's probably already there on the screen. Or if if that's too much for you, write it out to share the good news of the gospel here. Imagine if all the people at all the campuses of Wheaton Bible, people are watching this who are kind of, you know, uh, from other churches and other communities, if we all just said this Holy Week, because we know this may be the most open time people are to the gospel in your lifetime and in my lifetime. This Palm Sunday to Easter may be the greatest opportunity that we have. So what would we do? We don't be afraid. We have peace. We go on mission because Hosanna means God, and it's most literal, God save us. And if Jesus has changed your life, if he has saved you, I want to invite you this week, the most receptive week perhaps in our lifetimes, to show and share the love of Jesus to people who do not yet know him. The people who cheered Hosanna Maybe we're disappointed because he didn't come to create a political kingdom and overthrow a Roman empire. Right now, I can tell you that Christians and non-Christians alike are getting sick and are gonna get sick and the kingdoms of the world are not yet the kingdoms of our God and King. We pray thy kingdom come so he might come and set everything back right. But for now, what we can do is help women and men, young people to understand that the kingdom of God is not a kingdom of this world, but they can know him. They can have their sins forgiven. They can receive new life. They can face this pandemic with a confidence and a peace that passes all understanding because we know by the end of the week, Jesus rose from the dead. And I don't know about you, but I don't need to follow this philosopher or this theologian or this person with thoughtful deeds and actions. I'm following the guy who was dead on Friday and on Sunday was back from the grave. Can I just encourage you this week, perhaps the most receptive time of our generation, that you press that Facebook Live button and that you show and share the love of Jesus both physically, both online, and do that so that the name and fame of Jesus would be more widely known. May we behold the good news of the gospel, the throne of God above, knowing that we have a strong and perfect plea. Let's go to the Lord in prayer and trust him to change everything. Father, I do come before you. We come before you at Wheaton Bible, at all of our campuses represented in all of our homes. And Father, I pray, we pray together, Lord, that you might indeed inspire your people to show and share the love of Jesus in these difficult days. Father, I pray for an openness for neighbors and friends and family. And I pray for a boldness that we together might press that live button, might share that testimony, and might invite people to hear the good news of the gospel then and invite them to Easter worship with us at Wheaton Bible, knowing that the gospel will be clearly presented and lives will be changed. Here I am, Lord, Isaiah said. Here I am, Lord, send me. Just with your head bowed and your eyes closed, all across where we might be, would you just say to the Lord, here I am, Lord, send me. In Jesus' name and for his sake we pray. Amen and amen. Let's respond to God's word with another song.
Well, Wheaton Bible Church, we hope you have a great week. We're all together in this, and we can't, we can't wait to celebrate with you on Good Friday.